Our military has almost 200,000 troops deployed around the world. We are still at war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. U.S. military injuries and deaths top 58,000 for just Iraq and Afghanistan alone. That doesn't count suicides and a related silent destroyer you probably haven't heard much about that's of growing concern. Concussions our warriors get in training and in action. Today we begin with Ryan's story, an elite Navy SEAL whose sacrifice may help save others, even in civilian life. Frank Larkin was Sergeant at Arms, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the U.S. Senate until last March. The President of the United States! That's him leading President Trump into the State of the Union address. Larkin is also an American warrior. He was a member of the Navy's elite SEAL team. This really captures the uh, awards that Ryan received. His son Ryan followed in his footsteps, also a highly decorated Navy SEAL who did four combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Last October, Ryan was laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery. This is a story of a high-performing, highly rated Navy SEAL who served his nation with valor, became injured as a result of that service, and was left behind. He had made statements such as, you know, it's going to take guys killing themselves before the system wakes up that they got a problem. He also said that I'm not going to live to an old age. I'm broken inside. Something's wrong inside my head. Nobody's listening. At age 29, Ryan took his own life. The morning of Sunday, April 23rd, we had come home from an overnight trip and uh, found that he had taken his life um, in the basement of our, our home. Ryan um, was dressed in his uh, SEAL Team 7 t-shirt. He had illuminated a shadow box that contained his ribbons, medals, and other insignia. Ryan long believed he suffered traumatic brain injury from concussions during his military service, but he was unable to get the diagnosis or effective treatment. He said, if anything ever happens to me, I, I want my body used for um, traumatic brain research. So on that horrible day of you know, April 23rd, we were able to, um, on his behalf, donate his brain for, for that study. Ryan's story and the analysis of his donated brain tissue are helping open doors, revealing how a soldier's post-traumatic stress may be exacerbated or even caused by brain injuries. Can you just give an example of the sorts of things they're exposed to that can cause them concussive injuries or brain injury? Ryan was a sniper, so he fired high caliber uh, sniper weapons, you know, the 50 caliber category. Gives an awful lot of pressure. Exposure to IEDs, which, you know, the battlefield was littered with IEDs. There's a variety of sources that can cause, you know, concussive effects uh, that ultimately could result in damage. Because the damage is invisible on regular MRI scans, doctors long lumped the mysterious suffering of brain-injured troops under the catch-all of post-traumatic stress disorder. But a sea change began in 2011. What new do you know today since 2011 about this? Probably more has been discovered from 2010 to today than in the entire history of science before 2010. So, because there's been so much interest and attention focused on this, this problem. Neurologist David Brody heads up traumatic brain injury research at the Uniformed Services University. He helped lead a landmark study in 2011. Before that, a traumatic brain injury, a concussion, was something you just shrugged off and are you hurt or are you injured? And you just got back up and went back at it, both in sports and in the military and in real life. But 
we recognized around that time that there were real serious consequences of concussive traumatic brain injury, that there was a lot more injury than people had previously recognized. I had an idea. Dr. Brody and his team were first to use a new MRI technique called diffusion tensor imaging on soldiers. That allowed them to examine axons, the most vulnerable part of the brain, where long wires transmit information like celery stalks move water. But after injury, the brain's axons become like celery soup. Same color as celery, may smell like celery, but quite disrupted. And now the water is going to diffuse pretty much the same in all directions. So we could use diffusion tensor imaging to detect the difference between celery and celery soup in the brain. The results were shocking. Brains that looked normal on regular MRI scans were obviously damaged when imaged using the new technique. Dr. Brody found abnormalities in nearly one-third of the soldiers who'd been injured in blasts. How many men and women in the military you think are subjected to this potential type of injury, whether they're in the training or they're actually out in the field being exposed to this? The official numbers are that there's about 375,000 U.S. military service members that have had traumatic brain injury from 2001 till the present. We think the real numbers may be substantially higher than that. It's probably maybe twice that many. What percentage is that of, of the military? Some estimates are that between 10 and 20 percent of deployed military service members have a brain injury during their deployment. The findings led to new military directives on how to detect and treat brain injury from explosive concussions. Yet heroes like Ryan are still slipping through the cracks years later. He never even had an exam using the special MRI technique. That's not something that a regular doctor can just order. I think he had conventional scans, as far as I can tell. How did it come to your attention that he perhaps had brain injury? It's when he had the second, third tours that were back to back that we noticed that, you know, he wasn't the Ryan that we saw enter the Navy. The wheels kind of came off. Um, we saw an amplification of um, the anxiety. Uh, we saw depression ebb and flow. Uh, he was having problems with disorganization, a lot more issues with memory. Alcohol played a role as he was trying to, to get to sleep. He was not having a lot of success with the medications that they were putting him on. He started suffering what I call is, uh, you know, systematic injury of, um, you know, they started hanging labels on him, you know, uh, substance abuser, alcohol abuser, you know, prescription drug abuser, treatment failure, uh, operationally unfit. This just created more wounds, you know, for somebody that had literally been a top-rated operator, to now have to wear these labels was something that was very much a, a struggle for him. Ryan's journal reveals desperation and despair. I need treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, he wrote. And speaking of his honorable but forced discharge in 2016, he wrote, I have been separated from everything that I love. Ryan's brain revealed telltale scars of concussive injury visible under a microscope after death. Even if he'd been diagnosed with traumatic brain injury in life, there's no cure, only intensive treatment for symptoms, headaches, mood disorders, and sleep problems. What would you say is an important key to someone like Ryan Larkins who's seeking help and feeling all these things you describe and things aren't working for him? We're working really hard to find new MRI methods that will be able to see that scarring right at the junction between gray and mat white matter that I mentioned earlier, but we're not, we're not there yet. So it's clearly a lot more research needs to be uh, uh, performed before we were able to make a definite diagnosis of somebody like Ryan Larkin while he's alive. And that's the ultimate goal.